Experiment 9 in Chem 1211 is titled Crystal Growth Techniques, and in this experiment we'll investigate methods for the growing and observation of crystals, which are solids that contain a regular array of particles arranged in a lattice. Crystallization is similar to precipitation in that the grand idea is to get a solid to come out of solution in some way, forming a regularly patterned solid within the solution. But crystallization is different from precipitation in that it's very slow and it's designed to produce a regularly arrayed solid as opposed to a solid containing molecules in just a random orientation. So we'll learn the molecular basis of crystallization techniques in this experiment, much of which has to do with ideas about solubility and the effects of temperature and the solvent used on the desire of a solute to want to come out of solution. Let's first revisit the idea of precipitation and explore how a solid can come out of solution. So imagine we had a solution of some solute. I've drawn the solute molecules in red here and we introduced into that solution very rapidly either a solvent in which the solute is insoluble or some ion that causes the solute to come out of solution. Very rapidly we would see solid form at the bottom of the beaker and if we managed to remove all of the solute there would be no solute molecules left in the liquid. At the molecular level, because this process happened so rapidly, the molecules didn't really have time to align themselves in a regular orientation. And so the arrangement of molecules we would see would be random, and the solid in this case would be what we called amorphous. It would either be a completely amorphous solid, or it would be composed of very small crystals in a powder-like form. This is precipitation, and it relies on the rapid formation of a solid. Basically, there's a mad dash as soon as the insoluble solvent or the precipitating ion is introduced to just get the heck out of solution as quickly as possible, no matter the orientation of the molecules when they do so. Crystallization is different. Crystallization relies on the slow precipitation of molecules from solution, and this can be achieved in a number of ways. The basic idea, the initial idea for crystallization is to convince a very small number of molecules to want to precipitate from solution. So the idea is not to cause a mad dash out of solution like we do if we drown the solution in, say, a precipitating ion, but to just convince a few molecules to get out of solution. This causes, via a very slow process, what we call the nucleation of a very small crystal. So the red square that you see in the bottom of the solution is a very small crystal forming from this small number of molecules who want to get out of solution given the conditions that we've set up. And we'll talk about those conditions specifically in more detail in a little bit. Over time, more molecules are induced to join that growing or nucleating crystal. And over time, again, over a very long time, we deliberately set this up to take a long time, a crystal forms. So we rely on the favorable thermodynamics of this regular lattice of atoms or molecules that gets set up when crystallization occurs so that over time, over a very long time, the thermodynamically most stable thing for the molecules to do is get together and form a regular lattice. So at the molecular level now, because we induce the precipitation process to occur very slowly and over a long time, we have a regular array of atoms or molecules at the molecular level and what's called a crystalline solid. Crystalline solids are great and they are absolutely essential to the study and advancement of chemistry. This is for a number of reasons. First of all, they're regular. So they're relatively easy to understand at the molecular level and we don't have the issue of randomness coming in when we try to kind of project from the molecular level to the macroscopic level. In fact, you can infer molecular properties from macroscopic measurements of some types of crystals. The second thing we gain is predictability. We can predict the properties of a crystal because we know what it looks like over a very, very long range. We essentially can characterize the crystal over the entirety of its structure. The thing we're most often interested in predicting is the molecular structure of the components of the crystal. So this is used to characterize newly synthesized organic compounds and proteins whose structures are otherwise unknown. We can rely on X-ray crystallography, but a prerequisite to that is having a crystal of the adequate size and order that allows us to interpret the diffraction patterns 
to work backwards toward the structure. Apply three specific methods for growing crystals in this experiment. The first is called slow cooling, and it's one of the most common methods in use. It relies on the very general relationship between the solubility of a solid in a liquid solvent and temperature. In the majority of cases, the solubility of a solid increases with temperature. And we can trace this to the thermodynamics of the situation. So the free energy change, the delta G of solvation, is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And for most solids, delta S is greater than zero. This means that as we increase the temperature, the delta G goes down and the process becomes more thermodynamically favorable as we raise the temperature. The basic idea of a slow cooling experiment is to actually move down and to the left along this curve slowly, facilitating sort of what I call micro precipitations or crystallizations from the solution. So let's zoom in on this solubility versus temperature curve and see what we mean by this. So imagine we had two points on this curve, which are pretty typical for a slow cooling experiment. One is 293 Kelvin, that's room temperature, and the other is 353 Kelvin, which is our elevated temperature. So we take a solvent and we dissolve the solute in the solvent at 353 Kelvin as much as possible. We create a saturated solution so that we're on this curve, we're at the maximum solubility at 353 Kelvin. And then we allow it to cool slowly. That corresponds to moving a little bit to the left, lowering the temperature ever so slightly. That's going to lower the solubility ever so slightly, which means that as soon as we've moved a little bit to the left in temperature, there's more solute within the solution than it's able to handle. So what will happen is what we can think of as a micro-precipitation event. A few of those solute molecules will be saying, hey, I want to get out of solution. And they will. As the solution continues to cool slowly, this will happen again and again and again. As the temperature lowers, the solution contains more solute molecules than it can handle. Those solute molecules will grab onto the already crystallized solute molecules from before, and the crystal will continue to grow. So the net effect of all these downward movements, then, is crystallization. The second method we'll apply is vapor diffusion. And vapor diffusion relies on a relatively ingenious setup involving a sealed, relatively large container containing one solvent and a smaller inner container containing another solvent and the solute that we'd like to crystallize. The inner solvent is one in which the crystallizing solute is soluble, so we start with a solution within that inner chamber. The solute is insoluble in the outer solvent, and that's key. So we have what we'll call the soluble solvent, in the inner chamber and the insoluble solvent in the outer chamber. Now, over many, many hours and through the magic of spontaneous evaporation of the two solvents, the solvents will mix over time. And when it's all said and done, we'll end up with a mixture of both types of solvents within both chambers. Notice that the inner container is open, so solvent is able to condense and evaporate from that inner container. On the outside, we have now a mixture of the soluble and insoluble solvents, but more importantly, on the inside, in the inner chamber, we also have a mixture of the soluble and insoluble solvents. And if the solute is insoluble in this mixture, specifically if enough of the insoluble solvent gets in there, if it's volatile enough and the solute is insoluble, then we'll see a crystal, then crystals will form. Now the proper choice of the soluble and insoluble solvents here is critical. So before we undertake this vapor diffusion experiment, we'll do solubility tests using the solute and a series of candidate solvents to determine which ones would be best to use in this case. Just remember that we need one solvent in which the solute is soluble and one in which it's insoluble. Finally, we'll apply the technique of reactant diffusion to form crystals. And reactant diffusion, as its name suggests, is based on a chemical reaction, a reaction in which the reactants are soluble in a solvent, and the product is insoluble in that solvent. The idea, more or less, is to let the reactants mingle with each other very slowly via diffusion, allowing the product to form very slowly and crystals of the product to thus grow as the reactants find each other. So this diagram does a nice job of illustrating the situation. We've got the blue reactant A mostly on the left, 
the red reactant B mostly on the right, and we allow them to spontaneously move towards each other via diffusion, and where they meet in the middle, we get a very small number of product molecules forming product C. Those small molecules will form crystals and grow towards one another as the reaction occurs. This method, at least in our case, is relatively fast. The reactants will be metal salts and dissolved silicate, and the products will be insoluble metal silicates.